uh, in a somewhat unconventional setting, um, which hopefully will tie up to the interests of several of the people who are here. So that's the plan. And uh, to illustrate the notion of uh, classical ergodicity, um, I'll focus on billiards, also because I know there's a bunch of people here who are working on billiards, or who should be working on billiards, <laughs> instead of translation surfaces. Um, so, billiard, so this is driven by real-world applications. I want to emphasize, um, especially for my funding agencies. So billiards is uh, a game that you play by taking a a ball and using a cue stick to shoot it off. And then when it hits the edges of the billiard table, it bounces off. And the rule is that the angle of reflection has to be the same as the angle of incidence. And you can describe the set of all um, initial uh, conditions of the system by specifying the position on the billiard table where you shoot the ball off and the direction where you shoot it off. And this is called the phase space of the billiard. So it, uh, geometrically, it's just the billiard direct product with the circle of directions. So it's a three-dimensional phase space. Um, now, to illustrate the way uh, billiard motion happens, it, it, Three dimension is kind of complicated. We can't visualize it. Uh, so people use a two dimensional model, which is called a reduced phase space. I think Birkhoff initiated it. And uh, it's driven by the observation that we don't really care about the motion of the, billi of the ball between the bounces because uh, we know everything that's going to happen. The, the only new thing that happens is the point that it hits and the angle at which it reflects. And so uh, we just keep these two bits of information, the point of impact and the angle at which we bounce off. And so now the, the set of possible uh, initial conditions is reduced to a two-dimensional space, which is parameterized by, let's say, the distance along the boundary of the billiard and the set of possible angles, which we bounce off. Let's say angle with a tangent or with some other direction. It doesn't really matter. And then uh, we start at a given point, shoot the billiard off in a given direction. We record the next point of impact, meaning what is the length along the boundary that we hit, and at which angle we bounce off. And that gives us the billiard map. So it's now a discrete map of this two-dimensional space. And it's very easy to visualize. For instance, here is the billiard uh, map for a square, for a square billiard. So you hit the ball, and uh, it starts bouncing up and down like this. But in these coordinates, where you record the point of impact on the boundary and the angle with the tangent, you see that um, there's only four possible angles that can occur in a given trajectory. So this is essentially a conserved quantity. So the motion of the billiard in a square or in a rectangle is very regular from this point of view. And it's easily illustrated here. Here's another example. Uh, billiards in an ellipse, it's a very classical example. Uh, and here, there's also a conserved quantity. Geometrically, what you see happening is if you shoot the billiard uh, in a direction which doesn't intersect the major axis, the segment into, uh, linking the two foci, then there is an interior ellipse confocal with a given one to which the trajectory is always tangent to. <coughs> and you see in these coordinates, you see very cl plainly that the motion is restricted to a one-dimensional part of the available reduced phase space. 
And if you shoot the billiard in a direction so that it intersects the major axis, then instead of being tangent to a confocal ellipse, you're tangent to a confocal hyperbola. And again, now you see these the spectacles. The motion is still constrained to a one-dimensional part of phase space. Okay, so these two examples, the square and the ellipse, are very regular motions because you see there's a conserved quantity. Physically speaking, here the conserved quantity is the product of the two angular momenta around the foci. Um, but this is not the generic case. And here is a, a more generic case. If instead of uh, an ellipse, you took a stadium, meaning you took a rectangle and stuck onto the ends of it two semicircles, you see the motion again sort of densely fills up the configuration space, which it does here too. But if you look at the phase space picture, then you don't seem to see any conserved quantities. The motion isn't restricted to a one-dimensional set. Okay, so the motion here is not regular from this point of view. And um, not only is it not regular, it turns out to be ergodic. Uh, so ergodicity means that uh, a generic trajectory will densely wind around both position and its direction will also approach arbitrarily close to any given direction. So exactly this, this picture here. Another, so a generic trajectory, not all trajectories, but generic trajectories will be uh, uniformly distributed in phase space. Or another way to say it is that if you take an, a quantity which depends on position and momentum or direction and average it along a generic trajectory, along uh, com computer time average, then you will recover the average of that observed quantity in phase space. So this is one uh, definition of ergodicity. So for almost all initial condition, the time average, I'll be noted by a triangular brackets here, the time average along the trajectory will converge to the average of the observable um, on phase space. Okay, so this is classical ergodicity. Um, now I want to discuss quantum ergodicity. So here is a, a one slide uh, tutorial on quantum mechanics, which roughly exhausts <coughs> my own knowledge of the subject. So instead of describing a particle by means, uh, thinking of it as a point with a given position and momentum, um, a quantum mechanical particle is described by its wave function, and the wave function uh, this, uh, gives us the probability of the, the probability density of the particle to be at a given point at a given time. And the time evolution of this particle, so instead of saying I shoot it off and it goes in a straight line, uh, it's the time evolution is described by Schrodinger's equation, which which is this equation. Let's say in free space, it's a, uh, it says that the time derivative of the wave function is given in terms of the Laplacian of the wave function. Okay, this is in flat, uh, spa in flat space with no boundary condition. And there's a parameter, a small parameter here that um, is uh, Planck's constant. And I'm going to think of it as a very small parameter. And then the stationary states of the system uh, are the states whose, where the probability densities don't change in time. And it turns out that they are given in terms of eigenfunctions of this operator that we have here, the Laplacian, in this particular case. So studying stationary states is reduced to studying eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. You have to put a suitable boundary condition. Um, 
So the question that quantum ergodicity wants to address is what is the relation between the classical mechanics and the quantum mechanics when we take the limit of uh, objects which are large relative to the Planck constant, or mathematically you think of it as taking the Planck constant to zero. Um, so in particular, you want to see how this difference of regular motion and chaotic motion is manifested in a quantum mechanical particle. And then one um, sound bite in this subject is, uh, was formulated by uh, Michael Berry, who is one of the two persons here on the board. Uh, and that says that each eigenstate has a Wigner function, which is some phase space object. I will describe a little later, which is concentrated on the region which is explored by a typical orbit. So in particular, uh, for a system like the Bunimovich Stadium, uh, an ergodic system, um, a typical orbit, typical trajectory is dense, is uniformly distributed. So a wave function is supposed to cover all of phase space uniformly in some sense that needs to be prescribed mathematically. Um, so this is a, a very good uh, general rule. Um, it's not 100% accurate, and this is what I want to explore here in part, but it's a good uh, principle. Uh, um, so it's not always true. So for instance, in the Bonimovich Stadium, people seem to find oops, some strange patterns. Um, so these patterns, which are, you see here, eigenstates, which seem to be enhanced near periodic trajectories. I don't think there's a mathematical explanation of this at this time. There are other scars, so to speak, which have been explained, which I don't want to describe. And th those were understood by the physicists uh, a while ago. <coughs> Um, so let me just give a mathematical formulation of what, what it means to be uniformly distributed in phase space for a wave function. So uh, what the wave function tells us is the probability density to be at a given spot. So for instance, if I want to ask what is the uh, x coordinate of a quantum particle, what I'm supposed to do is compute an expected value, so use this wave function as probability density and compute the expected value of the first coordinate with respect to this probability density. And in the same way, there's a way, the, there's um, a device for measuring the momentum in terms of the Fourier transform of the wave function. And uh, for a general uh, observable, meaning some a uh, function of position and momentum, there is a pseudo-differential operator uh, defined from the observable so that the expected value at this quantum state is given by the inner product of the operator applied to the wave function against the wave function itself. So for instance, and the only thing that really needs to concern us, if I just want to measure some function of position, all I have to do here is integrate the uh, compute the expected value of this observed function of the position using the wave function as the probability density. So that's a simple-minded thing. And then uh, an interpretation of the statement that wave functions cover phase space uniformly is that these expectation values will converge as Planck constant goes to zero or the eigenvalue goes to infinity in this billiard system to the phase space average of the classical observable. So this would be uh, one interpretation of this semi-classical eigenfunction hypothesis. OK. Good. Now what is quantum ergodicity? I think um, so this was a discovery uh, of a mathematician now. We've stopped doing physics, of uh, Sasha Schneelman. Uh, it's now 40 years ago, uh, which says that if you have an ergodic system, so I've defined ergodicity, so either 
uh, an ergodic billiard or a manifold with ergodic geodesic flow, for instance, a negatively curved surface, then almost all eigenfunctions are actually uniformly distributed in phase space in the sense that I've described before. So the matrix elements, so the, expe the expectation values of any observable, if you measure them in these eigenstates, these expectation values will converge to the classical average of the observable. And again, this is for almost all of the eigenfunctions, not for <coughs> all of them. Uh, also normal basis. So you take, so I, uh, OK, I was uh, ignoring this point. So I'm thinking that there's only one set of eigenfunctions. Later on, I'll have to recant. But right now, when they say eigenfunction, it sort of uniquely defines them. So it is a statement, uh, it is a fact that if you take, let's say, a billiard or a compact manifold, then the eigenfunctions of Laplacian gives you an orthonormal basis of L2. OK, so this, uh, this was formulated. This, is a f uh, f this statement was formulated by Schneerman, who, who sort of knew how to prove most of it, I think, but couldn't uh, do part of it. And uh, this was proved rigorously because he told me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good reason. Yeah, I have it from the ho horse's mouth. No, no, no. He, he. There's a reason that uh, these guys had to fill in some details. There's some parts he couldn't do. Um, anyway, in the 80s, the, the, this was proven completely. Um, uh, for manifolds, and then the issue of boundary was done a little later. It's a technical issue, which is not that easy to come up with. And then in this interpretation, uh, scars can be interpreted as, as being subsequences which don't satisfy this. This is a strong definition of what scars means. There's the other definitions, but this is one that uh, I think Peter Salnik and myself formulated in some time ago. Um, do you know then that even for such sequences, there's some invariant measure on the right page? That was that's specifically what you were suggesting. Um, not necessarily unique. So any subsequence, you can extract a convergent subsequence. So it will give you, OK, one has to think why uh, what I'm saying is true. But it turns out that you can find limiting measures. But it might not be the uniform measure, Liouville measure. It might be some other thing. Um, and in somewhat different contexts, there are actually examples like this. Yeah, so one, one uh, thing that goes into this proof is that um, whatever limit measure you may have, it's a measure on phase space, and it's invariant under the flow, either geodesic flow or the billiard flow. But uh, I'm not seeing this here. So right now, we believe that uh, in the negatively curved case, there are no such exceptional subsequence. And this uh, we called quantum unique ergodicity. Um, and this has attracted a lot of attention. Um, for instance, uh, Lon Lindenstrauss proved that for a special basis for the modular domain and some other arithmetic setting, the, there are no such exceptions. Um, and uh, Nalini and Antaraman showed that uh, the limit measures, whatever they are, cannot be too singular. Uh, but the conjecture, as it stands, is open in any given surface. There's no surface for which it's known. Um, OK, so that, that's quantum unique ergodicity, which I do not want to discuss here. I want to go back to quantum ergodicity. So it's a much more generic statement, much weaker statement. OK, and so this was the definition of what is quantum ergodicity. I want now to discuss two new relatively new 
aspects of it. Uh, but this is a good time to ask questions before I, I move on to that. Nasa? Uh, what is the intuition behind the negative mixture? So, um, in so first of all, negative curvature is ergodic and chaotic. That, that's the first thing. So Schneelman's theorem applies to it. Okay, so that's one thing. Now another thing about negative curvature um, is that you want uh, to think where are the wave functions going to accumulate, and one obvious. Um, candidate is periodic orbits, because these are obvious measures which are invariant in the geodesic flow. So the first thing you want to do is rush to see what they are. Now, in integrable setting, uh, there are some stable periodic orbits, and people know, the physicists know how to construct uh, eigenfunctions or quasi-modes which, uh, uh, which accumulate to those. So in the integrable case, there are scars that are known. So you can try to do this in negative curvature, but then that construct the in negative curvature, the, the periodic orbits are unstable dynamically, and these constructions do not work. Um, and then you, you if you can't find a good candidate, then you just just say, okay, there are none. Yeah. Now, of course, not not of course. So in negative curvature. There's a whole range of invariant measures between periodic orbits, which are the smallest, and everything, uh, Liouville yeah. measure, which is everything. But uh, those are like fractal objects, and so lacking some good reason or, lack or, no or not knowing they exist, you just assume that if it's not periodic orbits, it's everything. So I have to admit that initially, when we first started thinking about it, our thinking was opposite based on some Langland's philosophy, but we very quickly recanted uh, after Alex did some numeric <laughs> for us in, this was in the student days. So, um, so we believe it's correct, but uh, there is no proof. I, I want to emphasize in any single instance that it's that, that this holds. And there are toy models of the situation, so not negative curvature, but let's say uh, there's something called the quantum cat map, which uh, is something that's too complicated to describe here, where um, we know that there are scars, and at the same time, we know for a good basis, uh, you do have convergence to this phase space average. So there's, there's some evidence for it. Okay, so let's move from chaotic system back to simple systems. So I want to describe two things. One is what happens when you try to do quantum ergodicity in non-ergodic systems. And the other is to refine uh, quantum ergodicity to look at small-scale behavior. And yeah, I think I'll, I'll have time to do them both. Okay, so again, driven by real-world applications. Uh, we want to look at uh, billiard systems which are not integrable uh, and want to check quantum ergodicity for those. Now, for ergodic systems, Schneelmann's theorem says that uh, almost all uh, eigenfunctions are uniformly distributed in phase space. And for integrable systems, this is definitely not true. Uh, but nonetheless, I want to explore what happens, uh, for instance, in this kind of billiard, an L-shaped billiard. And L-shaped billiard is a special case of a rational polygon, okay, for which there are many people here working on this. Um, Where is that billiard table from? <laughs> She has one, but there are, there are many of them. There are many of them. Uh, probably, I think so. I, I, okay, I stole a lot of pictures. Uh, people who want to show, to see a fun video, uh, people who read the Guardian, like myself, there is a video. People built an elliptic billiard, 
and uh, there's actually a contest, there's a game, so you put a, a, a uh, billiard ball, Let, let's go back to this, at the two fossae, it's a video and I wasn't sure I'd be able to show it, you put a billiard ball at, the two, uh, at one of the two fossae and then uh, what happens is if you shoot it off, it will always land on the other, on the other focal, focal mm -hmm. point. And so the game is to, um, uh, to put the billiard ball anywhere and to land it in the two pockets where the, f the fossae are. So look up The Guardian. There's a guy called Alex Bellos, B-E-L-L-O-S. It's, it's a fun video. So again, this is real life stuff. <laughs> Good. So let's uh, go back to really every life that Alex was studying us. Um, billiards in rational pot. What do they do here? In rational polygons. Uh, so a rational polygon, uh, one def the first definition you want is a polygon where the angles are all rational multiples of pi. So for instance, a rectangle, or an L-shaped billiard, or a hexagon. And uh, this is the right definition if the polygon is simply connected. Otherwise, uh, this is not a good. Uh, this is not a good case, and some other definition. So, um, uh, if you look at the group generated by the reflections in the sides of the polygon, that's supposed to be. You require that to be a final group, and then this example is ruled out, while this one survives. But most of the time, I'll think of the uh, simply connected case. Um, so, again, driven by real life applications, you want to explain this experiment. Here is billiards in the hexagon, and if you look at the billiard map on the reduced phase space, you see there's a conserved quantity. So, this is a regular, sort of regular motion. It's not integrable in a certain technical sense, which I've not explained. Uh, it's called a pseudo integrable system. Uh, the, the, when you look at the three-dimensional uh, phase space, the, uh, the invariant of the motion constrains the, 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 the motion to lie on the surface, but unlike the case of the ellipse or the rectangle, the, this, the surface is not a torus, but it's a higher genus thing. Uh, what did they say? For the hexagon, it's not a torus. Uh, what did so unlike... Oh, it is a torus. It's not a torus. Not a torus. So unlike the case of a rectangle or an ellipse, where the invariant surfaces are tori, meaning have genus 1, here the, the invariant surfaces have higher genus. There's a formula to compute them. It's in depending on the angles. For an L-shaped billiard, the genus is 2. I forget what it is for the hexagon. Anyone? of the experts remember? Somewhere here. I can show you a slide. Anyway, it's easy to compute the genus. It's a pseudo, it's called a pseudo integrable system. Uh, so from this picture, it is clear that the motion is not ergodic. Now the, the restriction of the billiard flow to the invariant surface is called a directional flow. And the invariant surface, you just take, think of it in phase space as there's six possible angles, and then uh, the, the position of the particle is not constrained. Um, so what uh, Jens Markloff and I realized a couple of years ago is that uh, even though the motion is not ergodic for a rational polygon, if you're naive, if you don't know what quantum ergodicity means in the sense of phase space, but just think of configuration space, like I did in my youth, then you still have quantum ergodicity there. That is, if you take any observable, which is independent of the momentum, just depends on the position, and compute the expectation values, you will recover the phase space average. Or another way to think about it, if you sample the eigenfunction on a subset, on a fixed 
subset of the billiard table, then for almost all eigenfunctions, you will just be measuring the relative area of the subset. So again, the motion is not ergodic here. OK, these guys look, uh, Vincent and Eddie look very skeptical here. So I want to, <laughs> uh, I want to justify this. Again, because it looks, it, it, this is a, a very simple observation if you know the subject, uh, but people didn't seem to think of it before. So now I'll show you how to prove quantum ergodicity without getting into any uh, details. So the. That's the statement here. This is for uh, eigenfunctions on the fold unfolding surface? No, no, no. So I don't want to know what is the translation surface. Oh, okay. For me, there's just a billiard. There's a reason why I don't want to there's know. No, boundary conditions. It's just no, no, there are boundary conditions. Oh. Yeah, so you put Dirichlet boundary yeah. conditions. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the billiard here Dirichlet eigenfunctions. OK, so here is how, uh, in a nutshell, how to prove uh, quantum ergodicity. So one way to show that almost all elements of a sequence converge to 0 is if you show that the mean square converges to 0. OK, so I, I take the expectation values, subtract the classical average. So I want to show that the expectation values converge to the classical average. So what I'm going to show is that the mean square converges to 0. And that's enough to, show to, to, sh uh, to give you that almost all of them will have to converge to 0. Now, what Schneerman did was connect such a variance, so I'll, let's call it a quantum variance, to a classical variance, meaning you look at the time average of the observable along a trajectory and compute the variance when you average over all possible initial positions. That's called the classical average. Ergodicity is equivalent to saying that the classical average, the classical variance tends to zero. The way I formulated initially was saying almost all trajectories are uniformly distributed. Uh, uh, Birkhoff's L2 ergodic theorem is a statement that the L2 norm, this variance, converges to zero. That's equivalent to ergodicity. Now, the, the key step in the proof of quantum ergodicity is the statement that the quantum variance is bounded by the classical variance. Now, so here I'm taking a limit of large energy. So I'm averaging over all eigenfunctions. And here I just take a fixed time. Now, for an ergodic system, uh, the classical variance goes to 0. That's a statement that almost all periodic, almost all orbits are uniformly distributed for any observable. Now, what's special about rational polygons is that if you look at observables which depend just on position, but not on the direction, then it's still true that the classical variance disappears. And um, so if you give me that, uh, this will say that as t goes to infinity, I now take another limit, the limit of t going to infinity. The left-hand side is independent of t, so I'm OK to do that. Then as t goes to infinity, this will tend to 0, which forces this quantum variance to be 0. And therefore, almost all elements, almost all expectation values converge to the phase space average. OK, so the statement that for rational polygons, the classical variance vanishes for isotropic observables is, in a special case, just Kronecker's theorem about uh, the uniform distribution of irrational lines. Um, so here is the, the general statement that uh, in a rational polygon, yeah. almost all of these directional flows are uniquely ergodic, meaning in whichever position you start. So for almost all directions, in whichever position you start, 
the, the orbit is uniformly distributed. OK, so the time average converges not to the space average, but to the average of the observable along this invariant surface, along the directional flow. But if you take isotropic, isotropic observables, um, you just recover the big measure on the billiard. So even though uh, for general observables, the limit does depend on your initial direction, for isotropic observables, if you forget about the direction, uh, you just recover the big measure. So again, this is a special case. And uh, if you take a, a square billiard, or instead of a square billiard, you take the uh, translation surface, or just put periodic boundary conditions, then the statement is just that an irrational line, so almost all lines are irrational, an irrational line is uniformly distributed on the torus. OK, so the conclusion is that, uh, OK, these guys are happy now. Uh, the classical Tom Cruise. <laughs> You can ask, OK, you're, you're betraying your age. <laughs> Most people here are asking who's the older guy. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, the, uh, so the classic, we show that the classical average for isotropic observables is 0, and the, the classical variant, uh, variance is an upper bound for the quantum variance. And if that is 0, then the quantum variance is 0. Therefore, almost all eigenfunctions are uniformly distributed in configuration space. OK, so again, this is a very simple deduction. You just need to know, just cite a, a few things and need to know the proof. It's not, uh, it's not a big deal. Um, now, what I want to emphasize here is this is completely qualitative. There's no quantitative aspects to this argument. That is, I know that almost all observables converge to what I want them to, but it doesn't give a rate at all. And this is what I want to discuss in the last few minutes that I have left. This is the issue of small-scale quantum ergodicity. And again, I'm only going to discuss what happens in configuration space. Now, if we, if we were to go back to, uh, to the Queen, um, the way Michael Berry formulated uh, the semi-classical eigenfunction hypothesis and the way most physicists think about it is that um, it's a distributional statement. That is, uh, not only are the expectation values supposed to converge to s some global average, but uh, it's also supposed to be true if you localize a statement and compute expectation values on shrinking sets, sh sets which shrink with Planck's constant or the eigenvalue all the way. As long, uh, so they, have, they can't be too small. You still need the eigenfunction to oscillate. So oscillate means they, they have to be larger than the wavelength scale, which is 1 over the square root of the eigenvalue. So what we want to understand is the average of the, uh, let's call them the masses, of the eigenfunctions when you average them on shrinking balls, the balls which shrink with the eigenvalue of the eigenfunction. And uh, this is something that's useful for understanding some final properties of the eigenfunctions. For instance, the structure of the nodal lines, the places where they are 0, and uh, other things. And uh, in negative curvature, um, there are results n uh, which are known, uh, for instance, uh, which allow you to study what happens on balls which shrink very, very slowly like one of the logarithm of the eigenvalue. And there's some statement which um, says that these averages at least don't go to 0 and don't go to infinity. 
It's, it's a rather weak statement, uh, but this is what's available. Probably that could be improved, but um, this is what's available right now. Um, so I decided. Okay, so I decided to look at the next simplest, not the next, at the m much simpler case of the flat torus, which is like the rectangular billiard, actually the square billiard. So here, um, the eigenfunctions are semi-explicit in the sense that there's a, a, a very simple basis for the eigenfunction, just sines and cosines. And then every eigenfunction is a superposition of these sines and cosines. Uh, the only constraint is that the frequencies out of which you build the sines and cosines are constrained to give you the same eigenvalue. So you are parameterized by a sum of two squares. So you look, and there are many ways of writing an integer as a sum of two squares, typically. And so you get a lot of interesting eigenfunctions which are not explicit. OK, I didn't quantify many. That will be the next slide. The number theorists are waking up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to study what happens for these flat tori, small scale ergodicity for these flat tori. So again, a flat torus is like a rational billiard. That's not the way I, you usually think of it. So we know global quantum ergodicity from the argument I gave you. That that's not the right way to do it, but that's one way. Um, so we, uh, this is some very recent work uh, with my former postdoc, Steve Lester. So we were motivated by work of Hamid Khazari and Gabriel Riviere, who looked exactly at the situation of tori, and uh, were able to show that the, these averages tended to 1 for almost all eigenfunctions. Uh, if the balls were shrinking, oh, there's a minus sign missing. So look, we are talking about shrinking balls, not expanding balls. <laughs> so, um, so we want balls whose radius shrink to 0. So we're looking at shrinking balls. This is the radius. Uh, but not, not too slowly. So the they were showing some exponent, and Steve and I uh, were able to improve this to a different exponent. And what is important that in dimension 2, you allow to take balls which shrink all the way down to the Planck scale, which is uh, the right the right scale, uh, if you believe the semi-classical eigenfunction hypothesis. So there should be a negative sign here and a negative sign here. So in particular, in two dimensions, we, we are able to take balls which shrink all the way down to uh, lambda to the minus half. So we're quite uh, happy with the two-dimensional result. That's, a, that's an optimal result, this we knew. Also philosophically, you can't expect to say anything interesting beyond that scale. Uh, but we are very unhappy with the result in higher dimensions, so for higher dimensional tori, uh, because we didn't have the right scale. We wanted this scale, and we get some other exponent, and these guys got some slightly worse exponent. Um, then uh, I discussed it with Jean here. And he came back the following day and said, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> uh, so um, OK, from my point of view, the good news is that, you can't, that uh, he couldn't improve our, our bound. <laughs> 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 and the bad news, or maybe it's good news, is we couldn't improve it, not because of uh, weakness of technique. It's because it just falls. So, uh, he constructed a, an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions where there is a positive proportion of guys which do not, which are not uniformly distributed in scales which are smaller than this one. 
Now, what it means philosophically, I haven't digested yet because this happens like a week or two ago, so, um, after I'd committed to speak about this. Um, so that's that's something uh, I'd like to uh, understand in in better detail. Now, um, there's a refined version of this. This will be my last two slides, which. If you look in high dimensions, where the whole uh, reason for my unhappiness is lies, uh, there's a final question you can ask. So what Valentin was sort of jumping up and down about earlier was that we know that the dimension that of the eigenspaces on Tori, they're just the number of ways of writing the eigenvalue as the sum of d squares, d being the dimension now. Um, if the dimension is sufficiently large, let's say three or more, then it's roughly uh, a power of the eigenvalue. When d is two, this doesn't give you the right thing. Well, more or less the right thing, but not exactly. And so you can ask, what happens if you restrict to an eigenfunction, an eigenspace? Just take a, a big eigenspace, look at, take an orthonormal basis inside of there, and, and ask, are all of these, or most of these, eigenfunctions uniformly distributed in small balls? So Steve Lesser and I checked this, and um, we are able to show that in dimension 3 and 4, this is true exactly up to the scale where we can prove it without restricting an eig to an eigenspace. So. So uh, as long as the balls shrink not faster than lambda to the minus this exponent. Um, and this is a more arithmetic result than anything I've said before. And uh, uh, several people have discussed this issue here now. And there is one arithmetic input into this result is the following question about statistics of lattice points on the sphere. So uh, here we have points on the sphere of radius square root of lam lambda, integer points. So there are many of them. Now for each such integer point, I look at a cap around it and ask how many other lattice points lie in this cap. I don't count the center because that's already there. It's not interesting. So I look at oh, the number of lattice points on this same sphere, which are different than the center of my cap. Um, I forgot to say the distance y around this point. And then the, the result that one needs to know is that, on average, when you average over all lattice points in the sphere, the number of other lattice points tend to 0 if the cap is sufficiently small. And what is small and what is large here is sort of obvious after you think about it. We we had some discussions here about this. Yeah, this is the right definition. So uh, we know how to do it in dimension 3 and 4. And so uh, I think uh, some people here will know how to do this or know, already know how to do this in higher dimension. So this is one arithmetic input into this theory. I've, I've hidden most of what I've discussed until now had no arithmetic. Uh, or oh, I've hidden it very carefully. Um, and this is one, one fun thing to think about if, if you haven't thought about it before. OK, so let me just summarize. So I've tried to explain what quantum ergodicity means. I hope I succeeded to some extent. And then uh, dis discuss two new aspects of it when you just restrict to configuration space. And one is um, rational polygons, so a non-ergodic system. And the other issue is quantum ergodicity in the small scale. And one natural question here is, can you say anything on the small scale quantum ergodicity for rational polygons? Not just for tori, but for an L-shaped billiard or something like this. Um, I'm sure something can be said, but uh, exactly the extent of uh, where you can go is not clear to me yet. Thank you.